So, um, yeah, so this is the core team behind the second trauma, but we do a whole lot of other things and they're all connected. And I'm going to start with a brief introduction of, in, including our, our, our panel, of, of what we do. That's going to take a few minutes and then we'll move, I'll, I'll move on to moderating the, the conversation with the team. Um, so, so you saw the second trauma. Uh, we just launched our website, the secondtrauma.net, and that's a place that if you're interested in more screenings and, and even bringing in, uh, bringing in some of us uh, on a panel, um, please reach out through the request a screening button. Uh, you can find the secondtrauma.net at the QR code on the stress balls on your tables, or you can just search for the secondtrauma.net or org or con. Um, and, and, uh, Professor Laddie is going, going to talk a little bit more about that when, when she comes up. So my friend and colleague, Professor Yvonne Laddie, we go back 30 years, is the director of the Logan Center for Urban Investigative Reporting at Temple University. And we also call her our journalism education advisor at the Philadelphia Center for Gun Violence Reporting, which I founded. So she's one of our key partners in, in many, many ways in, 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 a, in, the, in the film you just saw uh, that wouldn't have happened without her. And, um, the, um, and she, as I said, she's the director of the Logan Center, and my first question is going to be to tell us about the Logan Center. Uh, but to continue introducing the panel, wait, I'm gonna go back for a second because I wanna say something <laughs> about everybody. Um, if, so we go back a long time. She's an esteemed educator, but also an award-winning journalist, author, playwright, filmmaker, and now podcaster. She, along with her partners at WHYY Public Radio in Philadelphia, won the National Morrow Award for Best Podcast this year for their report on Stop and Frisk. Thank you. And, and I, I want to call out her co-host, uh, Sammy Cayola, who's with us today. And, and Sammy Cayola had the role of gun violence prevention reporter at WHYY while she was there, and we're going to go back to gun violence prevention reporting today. Uh, next up we have Dr. Jessica Beard is a trauma surgeon who cares for firearm injured patients every day and night that she works at Temple Hospital in North Philadelphia, which would be incredible enough, right? But she's also thrown in with us as the director of research at the Philadelphia Center for Gun Violence Reporting, thanks to support from her, her Stonely Foundation Fellowship, and she'll talk about her work. I, I just wanna say it's, it's perhaps obviously a very big deal for a surgeon to, to sort of alter the, her, the, one's career in this way. And what she's given to our organization, of course, is priceless. But the movement toward better gun violence reporting is just taken off because of, because of her leadership, really, really creating and expanding a new discipline ar around gun violence prevention, research around gun violence prevention and the role of the media. Um, and then Aronde, Aronde McLean, my God. I mean, you saw him, you heard from him. Literally superhuman, um, like the other, like a, a handful of other gun violence survivors in the city and co-victims. Just the bravest, most generous people I've ever met in my whole life. He, um, we had met once, but he actually went to the uh, Stonely Foundation looking to, to find support, and they supported him and asked if we wanted to host him, and oh my God, of course we did. And, and he's going to talk about some of the things he's been doing with us since then. And you heard about me already. Um, okay, so, um, so, so, so the um, Philadelphia Center for Gun Violence Reporting, that's our mission in a nutshell, right, collaborating to advance more um, em empathetic, ethical, and I can't read that far, but I think that's it. E ethical, empathetic, <laughs> and impactful reporting, right? That's, a, that's our mission, mission. And this is a secret sauce. This is how we do it in the events I'm going to show you some, uh, a quick slideshow, by bringing together journalists and survivors or people with extensive lived experience and researchers. And that's how we've been making a difference. And we do it by really engaging with journalists. And, and, and I've got some examples here. So um, uh, briefly, um, the, we launched the center about three and a half years ago in 2020 in the middle of all that. And um, we've got three core programs, the Credible Messenger Reporting Project, pairs people with extensive lived experience and more advanced professional journalists to report on uh, root causes, lived experiences, and possible solutions from the community perspective, and we fund that. And it's local for now, but if you're, in, if you're a journalist in Philadelphia, we'd love to have you on board, so please reach out. Um, we also have a professional development program that does a lot of things. We try to, you might have noticed that a lot of journalists who, and I was one of them, who, who report on gun violence aren't always from the communities that they're, they're covering, right? So we help local journalists, mostly, I, we do this mostly locally, um, we help journalists to, to um, you know, build relationships, earn trust, and learn more about Topic, about the topic by engaging the community. And we also you know, share a lot of other resources, including the research, the research which we, in, we engage them in. And, and, and that, that brings us to our third pro main program, which is our interdisciplinary research collaborative, and Dr. Beard will talk about that. 
Um, look, it's, it's not a contest, but just so you know where we're coming from. This is a map of Philadelphia that illustrates the, the locations where 15,000 people have been shot since 2015, and about 20% of them die. Um, this is produced by the, um, by the city office of the controller and was updated as of a few days ago. Um, and the, um, I, I just want you to know like the intensity of the challenge that drives me and that faces all of us and perhaps drives everybody you're looking at here and perhaps many of you. Um, in context, this is um, from AmericanViolence.org. It's maintained by a Princeton sociologist that shows that among large American cities with populations of more than a million, Philadelphia has had the highest rate of homicide among those large cities for most years of, of the century so far. Um, and the, uh, but of course, many smaller cities, you, some of you may be from, have much higher rates in, in Baltimore, St. Louis, New Orleans, um, whatever I'm forgetting. And the, um, and, and, but, but, but it's a, it's, it's a dominant problem. It's a dominant challenge for us here, right? Um, last year we did a, was a breakthrough year for us in terms of outreach. You know, we're still a kind of lean and nascent organization. But we partnered on more than three dozen events with all of these organizations. We've had incredible opportunities to work with partners at Penn and at Harvard, but also with um, at NABJ and um, the Online News Association. And that we, we had the opportunity to zoom in uh, to 27 newsrooms thanks to a Pointer Institute course where our friend Manny Smith, who you saw in the film from Yahoo News, is on the faculty and helped make that possible. And um, so, so we, we, uh, we're pretty active. Um, and this is the first, obvi perhaps it's obviously, the kickoff event of 2024. This is our, and, and we have a lot of events and activities, but I'm just going to show a few that we do in collaboration between PCGVR and the Logan Center. This was our, our Credible Messenger link up last spring at Temple University. You might recognize a few journalists from Philadelphia in the picture, some of our community partners, and, and it was to, to build the teams for that Credible Messenger um, reporting project. And you saw some video from the Credible Messenger Film Festival, which we also held at Klein College at Temple University. Um, the, um, this isn't part of a collaboration, actually, but last year the city's press club gave us their award for what is it, non-traditional news provider, and I'm incredibly proud of that because of the year because not only um, we have we offer a lot of resources on our site, but the only reporting we produce is the community reporting. So these are a couple of other credible messengers, uh, POC and Kim Kamara, who went to pick up the plaque. But um, at this point, we've had. I don't have exact counts, but we've supported, so we have a staff of four, some critical partners, a dozen sort of regular contractors, and um, 150 other people we've supported over these three years, um, credible messengers, community partners, and journalists to participate in our events, in everything from participating in our workshops to, um, to uh, focus group calls and so on. Uh, the, and right is Maxine Gooden. She's our main staffer who's not here today. She's our Credible Messenger community manager. Here she is at Harvard with a, a leader of a Boston uh, violence prevention nonprofit, um, the Louis D. Brown Institute. I've forgotten the woman's name, forgive me. And they've, they've both lost their sons to gun violence. And, and again, just brave and generous in, in the work that they do. Um, we had a panel like this at, o at ONA, which happened to be here in Philadelphia this year. And I just want to share like the energy we often have around this. We had a reception the night before at our press club, the Pen and Pencil Club, and more than 100 people came. And, and it's just, it's, it's kind of a proof of concept that whether, you're, whether you like our agenda or not, there's, there's something happening here. Um, there's a movement, is, is what I, I, I argue. A couple of pictures from this one of our research meetings that, that led to the study that, that you heard about. This is actually from a couple of years ago. Um, this is our most recent event. Just a couple of months ago, we, had, we held our first gun violence prevention reporting certification workshop. So we have developed a curriculum that includes um, uh, Professor Laddie talking about uh, trauma-informed journalism, uh, Dr. Beard talking about public health responses to, the, to, to prevent gun violence, um, another partner who isn't here uh, talked about um, solutions journalism, and, and Manny Smith was on the faculty for this event and talked about actual newsroom implementation and impediments and how to actually take these, these lessons back to the newsroom. Um, and so, so you, you get where we're leaning. It, just fundamentally, just making the shift from reporting on gun violence to reporting on prevention 
Okay, I'm gonna go off briefly on a tangent because this is one of my things. Like, if you think about this from a peace journalism perspective, we have business desks and health beats. We don't have illness beats and, 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 and bankruptcy beats, right? So why do we focus on, it only comes to war and conflict and crime and violence that we focus on the negative and, and we're contending that you should we should all be focusing on solutions primarily. Um, you just all got a copy of our, our, our new, uh, our new, um, our, our new uh, it's basically an episodic reporting toolkit. Uh, Dr. Beard's going to talk a little bit about that. You're the very first people seeing it. We've been working on it for about a year. She'll explain how it's, infor how it's been informed. Um, and the, um, we just got it Friday and printed it. And, and it, it, you're, you've got a near final edition. I, I realize we need to add an acknowledgments page and about to explain what's behind it. You're, go you're going to hear about that today. Um, and then finally, um, all of the, you, you, you all probably get postcards with most of these QR codes, except for the one on the bottom right because we just got it. Uh, the toolkit is also at pcgvr.org slash toolkit. So thank, thank you for your patience. I'm, I'm going to stop talking and ask questions now. Um, <laughs> so so I'm, I'm going to start with, 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 with Professor Letty. Yvonne, you yes. know, first of all, you know, please tell us about your work at the Logan Center in general because I know that you do more than just gun violence report, gun violence journalism, but also you know, what led you to collaborate with PCGVR and produce this documentary? So the Logan Center has only been around for a little bit more than a year. Um, I'm the first director, so I'm sort of building, it's like building an airplane in midair kind of vibe. Um, the idea is that so much investigative, like people come from big publications into Philly and they do these big stories about things that without really consulting or talking to people on the ground as much, or they'll find one person who fits the narrative they want to tell and that's how they do it. So the idea of the Logan Center is to sort of do community-based investigative reporting, which is like start with the community, see what they care about, and then sort of, you know, go from there. So like the podcast I did with Sammy and WHYY, it was really because even though, you know, there was a lot of you know shootings and murders in Philly, black people in Philadelphia were actually in these neighborhoods that are being affected. We're like, we want more police, we want stop and frisk. And when Sammy and I heard that, it was like, oh my God, this is the craziest thing I've ever, what the heck, black people want stop and frisk better? So, you know, it started with the community meeting and listening to people talk about what they've gone through and then sort of taking that idea and seeing and then exploring it in all different ways, from young black men to the police to um, politicians to see if we were so desperate in Philadelphia that at this point we were going to try to like beef up a thing that we know hurts black men, you know, I mean that's sort of the bottom line. So it's that sort of idea, we do, we have an education disparity series with Billy Penn, education in Philadelphia, is extremely problematic, so we sort of explored that. Um, the last podcast I did with WHYY was on housing. I mean, unless you're blind, you see all the claims up in Philly, you see the rents are going up, you see um, neighborhoods like Kensington that were traditionally working class, working poor, now being turned into trendier neighborhoods with young people moving in. So we sort of looked at that and sort of like young, this idea of, you know, young homeless people and how that's an area that the city can actually fix. Like you don't have to have 17 year olds living on the street or couch surfing. So we look a lot to what people are saying and how that inform our journalism as opposed to us sitting in a meeting and, and like coming up with these ideas that we think are the story. And so I've known Jim forever. We have a lot of shared trauma from covering police in Philadelphia. Um, he was a photographer that I was usually paired with and I cannot even tell you the untold horrors that both of us experienced through different lenses. His through his camera and me through sitting with the mom and having her tell me really intense things and then having my editor in my ear screaming at me about beefing it up because, you know, we could maybe get this on the front page. So we have this sort of shared trauma together. We also did a lot of work around Iraq and we have wrote books about war. And so we, he came and worked with me my first year as a graduate director at New York University. He 
someone I really love and respect. And I think that when you go through war with someone, which is what I felt we went through, the bond is like, it's like a really weird bond that I have with this man. So when I took this job, he was like the first one to call me, to want to meet with me, to want to support me. And through him, I met, you know, and I agree with everything he says, even though sometimes I have to admit I don't, you know, as someone who comes from the reporting end, I don't sometimes understand everything 100%, but I definitely buy into the big idea. And through him, I met Arande and Jessica, and it's been an incredible um, learning experience for me as someone who covered crime a lot and who's real, you know, my whole entire career was probably framed by telling a woman that her daughter was murdered by a serial killer when I was 25 years old because I got there before the police. So, you know, there's so much that goes on with all of us who cover crime. It's so difficult. There's so much personal trauma we suffer through. And so I'm really excited to be part of this. And I'm, I'm, I'm so blessed. <coughs> You know, we got to show you guys the doc. You know, it was such a labor of love, really. Um, very, it was, it was literally a, a labor of love for me. So, just stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm tasking everybody with with, with offering the grotesque oversimplifications of what they do. Because everybody, their people, get them for an hour easily. Um, I wanted to get the reminder of the very brief. It was in my notes and I forgot to say it because it has a lot to do with where we come from. Yvonne and I were reporting together at the Philadelphia Daily News starting 30 years ago, and I know a lot of people here have a lot of frontline experience. And when you hear us having critical, I just want to reiterate what I didn't say before, but I really want to make the point that we see the good reporting, by the way. We see the solutions reporting, we see the community based reporting, we see the special projects, we see the, the, the growth, we see the transition happening around, around the practice. But we still just see too much harmful reporting, and, that, and that's what brings us here. Um, and also, I, I'm just going to add another piece that, that the, other, the other thing sometimes people say that we do we do breaking news or spot news or gun violence reporting because it's cheap and easy. And you know what? If you've been on the front lines like us, it's not easy. And and, and, and so you know, I, I, I've been sunburned, and frostbitten, and hours without bio breaks or other meeting other needs, and and um, and you know, then you know, clubbed by police and threatened by neighbors. And then you get to carry the trauma for all of your life. It's not easy, and I respect the hell out of everybody doing it. And my, I, I'm not, I'll speak for myself, not my goal here, I think all of us, is just to try to help you share new information and help you do it better. And to that end, I'll finally get to my next question, my, my first question for Dr. Peter. Well, you know, again, it's a lot, but you do you do so much, right? I mean, you're a trauma surgeon at Temple, the Stonely Fellow, the research director. You know, how, how do you do it all? But also, you know, what led to your focus on, especially in research on gun violence prevention and the role of the media? Yeah, well, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much uh, for having all of us here um, and to being open, really, to some of the ideas that we're sharing. So as you heard in the documentary and also from Jim, I'm a trauma surgeon at Temple. Um, and what a trauma surgeon is, is a surgeon who uh, basically fixes bullet injuries in Philadelphia. Um, and that really means that my whole life, my expertise, my uh, kind of all of my technical abilities are focused on trying to help people recover from gun violence. Um, and it, it's really kind of almost perverse because there's tra trauma surgeons in other countries don't have the experience that we have in Philadelphia. They actually come here from Europe and other places to see firearm injuries. Um, you know, as a temple trauma surgeon, I'm basically like a battlefield surgeon. Every night I'm operating on someone who's been shot. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to continue to do that and to continue to see that. It's so personal, it's so human, without doing something to prevent it. Um, and that's really what drives me every single day to kind of step, to stay in the clinical sphere and, and help our patients, but also to, um, you know, kind of venture out into other arenas like this. Uh, I have a master's in public health, which means that I have some expertise also in, in prevention of health problems. Public health is different than healthcare. Public health goes upstream of problems. Public health addresses health inequities, and public health acts at a population level. 
Um, it's really clear there's more and more research, although many of you know that research on gun violence was pre prevented by our government until relatively recently. But there's more and more research that shows that we do have the solutions to gun violence from a public health perspective. Examples of those would be our hospital-based violence intervention programs, programs that help people recover from trauma, community-level interventions like cure violence. Those are kind of the violence interruption programs led by credible messengers. We have policies that prevent gun violence. States that enact policies that uh, prevent gun violence have less gun violence. It's not that complicated. We're just sort of choosing not to take a public health approach to gun violence. One of the reasons why you know, it's clear from research, but also that I believe we do not take a public health approach to gun violence is because reporting on gun violence does not present gun violence as a public health problem to our public. So people don't understand gun violence as a public health problem. And why would they? If you turn on the evening news and you see an episodic crime report, you think that person had it coming, it's their fault, it's an individual level problem, and the police are the only people who can respond to this. And when I see those narratives, like they hurt me. I'm responding to gun violence every day. I'm working on gun violence prevention. They hurt our patients. Our patients feel dehumanized. They, gun violence is a human story. Gun violence is preventable. And um, you know we have those solutions. And so what if we could have reporting that included those solutions? What if we could educate the public on how we could stop gun violence? What if our stories could be part of gun violence prevention? And so that's really what drives me to this and what drives me to work with PCGBR. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Dr. Beard. Um, so my first question for you, Rwanda, is, uh, you know, so we heard a lot in, in the film about your personal story, and I'm grateful to you and your courage uh, sharing that with us. Grateful is a ridiculous understatement, priceless. Um, but also, at the same time, and I, I, I misinformed you earlier, Arande first came to PCGVR as a participant in the Credible Messenger Reporting Project, and paired with Cherry Gregg yes. at WHYY, and produced a short documentary that's incredible, you can find it on our site, where he in interviews other survivors. Um, but, but what I want to ask overall, and, and, and then came back as our, as our Credible Messenger newsroom liaison, and then, um, and, and then has a new project that I'll ask about a little later. But what has it been like moving into the role of Credible Messenger, and then your role in this documentary, and, and, um, and, and you know, to, to, you know to, what's it been like to take control of your own story? Has it been different telling your own story through these means versus, how, obviously it's been different, but how has it felt telling your own story? Well, thank you, Jim, and thank you, everybody, to have a survivor on the stage because we don't get enough attention to tell everybody our stories. Um, to answer your question, Jim, um, being a uh, credible messenger, it was kind of scary, but it was fascinating at the same time because I was I wanted to tell my story. I wanted to tell the whole world and tear down the city, but working with Sherry Gregg, she taught me the steps how to really tell my story and help other people. Um, all the survivors, everybody want to tell their story, but they're afraid because the journalists are just attacking them and attacking them. It is not on purpose. They just want to get the best story. And I, and I understand that working with journalists. Um, so being a credible messenger, um, I got my story out and it was beautiful, maybe like 100. Maybe 100 people, 100 people uh, came out, and it was just actually, it was just a beautiful uh, turnout. Um, working with survivors, they just want to tell their story, and people don't take the time and talk to them. For example, uh, being in a newsroom liaison, I got a phone call maybe uh, two days ago in Philadelphia. A five-year-old girl got shot in Kensington. Um, I was just in my bed, and. Uh, uh, reporter called me, hey Rhonda, are you busy? And I'm like, well, I'm eating dinner while a five-year-old uh, girl just got shot. Can you come to Kensington with me so you can knock on the door and get the story for me? Well, hold on. I mean, did you go? <laughs> did, did you ever go to Kensington before? I never been to Kensington before. Wow. So, like, that's why we need to get, like, that's why I love Jim with this Credible Messenger project because I could have said, okay, let me call Jim because we have credible messengers. 
we have survivors or co-victims that we could call and say, hey, you live in kids and said, I'm gonna team you up with this reporter and maybe y'all can like go to this fire room, um, girl um, house. You don't have to call me. I'm not the only person that got shot in Philadelphia, but reporters don't know how to respond. If they get a story and they like the story and the story is good, okay, that's gonna be the survivor of the year. We're gonna just go to that person for the rest of their, our lives. But that's not fair. I don't know nobody, I don't know everybody in Philadelphia that got shot or was a co-victim. So that's why this Credible Messenger project is so important and everybody should be involved. So now you have Credible Messengers all around Philadelphia. Being a newsroom liaison, now I'm in the newsrooms and I'm kicking down the doors. And I'm telling them, like, listen, you need to listen to these survivors. They have the answer. And I talk to all these survivors. they like, listen, we want to talk, but the journalists not hearing me. They're not listening to me. All they do is talk at me. Journalists should have to, they, y'all shouldn't have to talk at the survivors. Y'all coming for answers, so why they don't listen? So. Thanks, Ronnie. I've, I've got two things to say. One is it breaks my heart, but I've got to just, this is all priceless, but I've got to ask everybody to tighten it up if we're going to keep Q&A time. Oh, okay? go ahead, go ahead. And, 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 and <laughs> me as well. Because I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go over again. Um, just, oh, no, I won't. I'll, just, I'll continue to say. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm catching a lot of love. Up. I'm catching a lot of love up here, and I work hard, and I care a lot. But no, Ronnie said that I gave me credit for bringing in the survivors and, and co-victims. And no, it's actually Ronnie and other folks like him on our team who do that. that that priceless work. Yvonne, uh, next, you know, uh, you know, we've covered a lot of first violence firsthand ourselves, and you know, I've heard you speak on other panels, and you always bring up radical empathy. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's the, the top priority for journalists covering gun violence, and what does that look like? Um, I, I hate to do this to you, but I have to say something about what Arande said. That's so, that is so annoying that a reporter called you <laughs> To, to go to the home of, 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 of someone who, who lost a child. I mean, you, it's not your job. And if reporters aren't, don't know how to do that, they shouldn't be doing the job. So I just want to say that that really, I just found that to be absolutely insane. But yeah, I talk a lot about radical empathy. And I read the book um, Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. And there's a quote in the book that I'm going to read very briefly that <laughs> explains it. And it's kind of the rule I, I use in my head that I put on my syllabus, that I tell anyone who will listen to me that the only way to really cover gun violence effectively is that we have to practice radical empathy. And as she calls it, she says, radical empathy means putting in the work to educate oneself and to listen with a humble heart to understand another's experience from their perspective, not as we imagine we would feel. Radical empathy is not about you and what you think you would do in a situation you have never been in and perhaps never will. It is the kindred connection from a place of deep knowing that opens your spirit to the pain of another as they perceive it. And that is what I think we all need to practice if we want to do this job right. Thank, thank you, Yvonne. Priceless. Um, the, um, I'm going to go back to Rwanda next briefly because you already kind of leapt into the answer to the next question. Because you know we've heard what you, what you, your recommendations in the film, and we heard some others firsthand. But you're working with a lot of victims and survivors, and you have been actually long before you started working with us. But what are you hearing from others about what they're looking for, what they want journalists to do and not do? Um, that's, that's funny. Uh, they just want them to listen. Um, they want them to be open. They just want, they just want to talk. And this is another thing that we do. And this is what I used to do as I was uh, uh, growing up. Um, a news station would say, hey, Rondé, you want to be on the news? And they let me talk for 20 minutes. I tell everybody, yeah, I'm about to be on the news for 20 minutes. This is my time. 15 seconds I got. <laughs> and it's always the, the part that I mess up at. <laughs> and they never say, like, Aronde, just be honest with them. Aronde, we did this for 20 minutes, but I got to cut it short. You're only going to be on in 15 seconds, and this is your part. 
I never got a follow-up story. It's never a follow-up story. That's the problem that survivors have. It's never a follow-up story. And I express that so much because that's what survivors want. How you going to report on somebody? <coughs> this 10-year-old boy got shot in the head. He in critical condition. That's it. Two weeks later, four weeks later, six weeks later. When I was watching the news, I used to be like, oh, what happened to that 10-year-old boy? It's never a follow-up story. Now I'm 10. I was 10. Now I'm 33. Now I'm doing all this good work. They're like, oh, wait. Is that the 10-year-old boy that got shot in the head? From 10 to 33, never a follow-up story? That's bad reporting. It should always be a follow-up story. I mean, I'm not going to tell you, say, okay, yeah, that 10-year-old boy, now he dead. No, I'm not saying that. But it should be a follow-up story. Report, I have a lot of reporters, I see a lot in the audience, that say, Rondé, are you doing anything? Hey, is, is, a, is a block cleanup? Can I, can I come and shoot the kids? That's what well, film the kids, sorry about that. But that's some things that survivors want. They would not talk to reporters. You know what, it's a, 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 a survivor called me maybe two weeks ago, Rondé, a reporter called me, should I, should I uh, be on the news? I said, for what they say? No, they just said that it's a new year and um, crime is 20%, 21% down. They want me to talk about my story and how we should um, go, by, go, go forward next year. And I'm like, oh, well, how do you feel about it? I don't know because that's all they said. They never, they never tell them exactly what's going on. They don't know, they, they don't know what, when this is going to air. I have reporters, I had an interview maybe six weeks ago. It never aired. And then I get a phone, I get a good text message this Friday, and hey, it's about to air in February. I don't even know what I said. I grew so much. I don't want that to be on there. I, now I know about the news. So I just want, oh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, sorry. And I'm we'll sure. all be available. I just, I just want to save time for open Q&A. And we're also, we're also good to hang out and talk to you individually. So um, no, it's never enough, actually, okay. Rondé. But, but, but for the moment, we've got to, we've got to share. Uh, hey, hey, Jessica, again, again I, know, I know it's a lot. But you discussed our, 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 your first study, the, or it's not your first study, but the, the, the study, the first study under the sort of, you know, in partnership with PCGVR, the harmful reporting study uh, during the documentary. But, um, you know, you've published others before we started working together. Um, you've got lots of other research in progress and some exciting new news. Can I ask for a quick summary? Sure. Um, so, yes, you saw our uh, study where we interviewed patients in the trauma clinic at Temple about uh, how they felt or their kind of perspectives on reports about their own injuries. And that was really kind of where we started with this particular line of research. Um, prior to that, I had looked at the epidemiology of gun violence in Philadelphia, um, and specifically the you know uh, spike in shootings that we saw related to COVID and containment policies and how gun violence has changed during that time. Um, and now what I'm working on with PCGVR is looking at uh, TV news clips on gun violence. We have over 7,000 TV news clips from all four uh, of our local television stations in Philadelphia um, from every single day of the year in 2021. Uh, and these are clips about gun violence. And what we're doing is uh, a media content analysis. So we're actually watching these clips and coding them. Um, and we've done kind of some preliminary work that we're working on publishing, uh, basically answering the question, how often is gun violence presented as a public health problem? Uh, and what we found is that the vast majority of clips remain as they were in the 90s, episodic crime reports. So 80% of clips were focused mainly just on a single shooting event. They did not include that context, those root causes and solutions that are so necessary for educating the public and uh, reducing bias and stigma towards people who are shot. Um, more than half of the clips included the police as the only narrator. Um, they were present in the vast majority of clips as a narrator. Uh, and there was 80% of clips had police imagery. So, you know, it's, it's what we expect, but we really have some kind of science around it. Um, 
We just got a grant from the National Institutes of Health. Um, this is pretty groundbreaking because up until very recently, again, the US government was not allowed to fund research on gun violence and gun violence prevention. Uh, this grant is looking to create <laughs> science and really establish kind of a new field of public health and media working together. Um, we are achieving expert consensus around what is harmful reporting on gun violence uh, with an expert panel. We'll be looking and measuring harmful reporting in those TV news clips. And then we'll be looking at how harmful reporting is or is not sustaining structural racism. So the thing that kind of we're not, we haven't really mentioned here is, at least for me, I believe, and I think that evidence would suggest that underpinning all, a lot of this episodic crime reporting and these narratives is racism. It is, it, it, it is allowed to continue and exist and persist because of who the victims of gun violence are in our city. And what we'll be looking at is to see if these harmful reporting elements uh, from our previous research and from this expert panel are more likely to be present in stories about people and places that are structurally marginalized. So that's the NIH grant, and we're really excited about it and to build on that. Thank you so much. And I mean, opening up a new era of inquiry, it's just incredible progress, and I'm just so proud to be associated with it. Okay, lightning round, everybody. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Rhonda, you know, at the same time, I, I'm not gonna try to read your minds, but I used to do some of what you're doing, and the, um, and Aranda is telling you, was telling you about uh, survivors who, who feel like they're not being heard and can't find journalists to hear the story. And at the same time, we hear from journalists, well, we're always telling journalists, you can't just invite, advance the police narrative every night. And they say, look, we're, un, we're under pressure, we're on deadline, we're doing more with less. And guess who's at the crime scene? Sometimes everybody else goes in and locks their doors and, and turns out the lights for maybe good reasons, and nobody's there but, but the public, but the PIO, right? So, um, so we're trying to help solve that problem, and Aranda has a new project. He went from being our part-time news <coughs> liaison to our full-time Stonely Foundation Emerging Leader Fellow, and uh, and 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 our, our friend uh, Sammy Cayola, wherever she went, is also assisting with this project. And um, but can you tell us about the new um, Survivor Connection? Okay, lightly well. Lightly. Okay, so basically, uh, we center in um, survivors' voices and journal and journalists. So simple. I t I, I do all survivors on my <coughs> list, journalists on this list, and I connect them. So it will be a directory of all, for journalists to talk to all the survivors. And I'm training them. We have a lot of people that's coming on board to train them. So the survivors will be trained, meter literacy, trauma. The journalists as well is gonna be trained and ready to go. So it will be a directory that I would give to the journalists. Hey, this is survivors in Kinderson, survivors in Alany. It will be a co-victim in West Philly. So they don't have to call me. You have your own directory that you could call everybody that, that we would train if you need all the answers. So if y'all are ready, y'all can give me your cards to reporters so y'all can be on the list as well. Thanks so much, Ronnie. And I foreshadowed this earlier, but uh, for, for Yvonne next, you know, I know that you have another gun violence project coming up at the Logan Center and that you're doing lots of other things as well. But, um, but what, what's next for the second trauma? Um, what can people do if, if they want to see it or show it to others? Well, right now we're in the process of trying to get it out there. I've entered it in some film festivals. We'd love to bring it to newsrooms. We'd love to bring it to classrooms. Um, I, you know, I am an educator, so I'm a big believer in, I don't see how to teach young journalists how to do this work. I think that what happens is you graduate from college and then your first job, somebody was murdered, go, and you have literally no idea, you just moved to this town, it's, you know, you're trying to build your career and you're immediately thrown into trauma. So what I'm hoping to do is bring this to colleges all around the country, with my, my friends here, mm -hmm. and actually talk to young journalists, young students, on how to do this better and to sort of prepare them for what happens. Because oftentimes when you graduate, your first job is police reporter or GA, and that's doing the murder of the day. 
Um, so that's, that's really my hope. So it's to bring it to newsrooms across the country, to colleges across the country, and to just spread the word because I feel like, honestly, like I, you know, I've been doing this for so long and I know like what you all are going through, how hard it is and how in your heart you really do want to do the right thing. Like Manny says, no one goes into this work saying, oh, how can I hurt people? It's actually the opposite. But the way this business works is your first job isn't going to be working in the city that you grew up in, where you know everybody. It's going to be someplace else. So there's an element of it that is a parachute. But all we can do is try to help you sort of be the best you can be, the strongest you can be, the best journalist you can be for the community, and also for your own freaking mental health, to be honest. Thank you so much. And, and then uh, finally, Dr. Beard, you know, um, we've all worked on it, but, but this, uh, you, you led the work that created this new guide. It, it grew out of your fellowship. So I was hoping that you could tell us about how it came about, how it's been informed, and, and maybe if there's a moment, what, what it's like, you've been like working with journalists and survivors uh, through this process. Yeah, so you all have this um, kind of book booklet that we're um, sharing with you today, really for the first time. And again, just to reiterate what Yvonne said, you know, um, in kind of the beginning of this, we were looking at, at the research and hearing from survivors and, and just hearing sort of how harmful episodic reporting is. And um, we, we thought, just stop doing it. And um, it's really through our collaborations and interactions with journalists yeah. that, of course, we realized that's not going to happen. Props to Manny right there. It'll never <laughs> happen. Um, so what uh, we did was actually back in the fall of 2022, we had a human-centered design workshop. So that uh, was led by a group of designers, uh, one of whom is a trauma surgeon, so with some kind of real personal uh, and deep understanding of gun violence. And we invited local journalists from Philadelphia um, uh, and really from kind of every uh, genre of, of journalism, uh, survivors and co-victims and a, a few scholars and people doing work in this area. Um, and we came together and we did human-centered design, brainstorming, prototyping and solutions, uh, creation around better gun violence reporting. So this is really collaborative effort. It's not me. It's, it's really this community of people within PCGVR. Um, and one of the kind of prototype solutions was an episodic reporting on gun violence toolkit. So that's what you see here. It was imagined and kind of collectively designed back in the fall of 2022. And then Stone Lee actually helped us work with Frameworks, which is an organization that uses research um, to uh, frame kind of health and social problems and advance change. And we worked with Frameworks. Frameworks led interviews, again, with journalists, um, uh, following up from that human-centered design workshop, worked with us, and we essentially created this toolkit. It's in its near final version, um, and we're happy to share it with you. Basically, if you look through it, you'll see you know, what you might want to do if you're at a crime scene, understanding that that's maybe not the, you know, best place to start, but you'll certainly find yourself there. We have some do's and don'ts. This kind of follows in some of the um, recommendations that we see for reporting on suicide that really have been enacted and, and uh, had really changed the practice of journalism. And those came from research, so that's kind of our imagining here for community firearm violence. And then we have some examples of what like a harmful narrative might look like that's stigmatizing versus you know alternative narratives. So prevention narratives and humanizing narratives. And you know there. And then finally, um, we have some examples of you know how, how to describe or present the root causes of gun violence because I think that's. Um, a, a large thing that's missing from these episodic stories, which is that gun violence is not an individual problem. Gun violence is centered and, and kind of a historic problem of racism. For example, our research shows that the areas of Philadelphia that were redlined are the places where people get shot today. And there's tons of other examples of that. So you have a driver, and then you have possible solutions. 
Um, and so those are there sort of as a resource of what our best research shows what a public health framing of gun violence might look like. So hopefully you'll find something helpful in here um, for yourself and um, there it, it will also be available online. Terrific, thank you. And once again, you can find that at pcgvr.org slash toolkit or at that bottom right QR code. Um, as we update the, and, and, as we update it, you're gonna, you've got a near final version, but as we finalize it, I'll finalize the, 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 uh, the copy at that link. Um, I just wanted to say one more thing um, about that, about that human centered design workshop. We conducted that under Chatham House rules, so every, so sort of off the record and anonymous, uh, and anonymous but um, I'm just gonna say, that was the first time everybody came. You'd be very hard pressed to find a Philadelphia news organization that wasn't represented there. You'd have to dig into some, the smallest, newest, digital first startups, but we had old media, new media, digital first media, and community media, and you get the picture. So, um, so it's not just us, it's everybody working together. Um, thanks again, everybody. Um, any questions? Chip. Uh, as a former crime reporter, let me ask, as a former crime reporter, let me ask the central conflict here. Yeah, by the way, I worked with Jim many moons ago Before on, <laughs> on crime reporting. Um, so we want to talk to victims. We want to tell their stories. We don't just want the police narrative. But for a victim to make that decision to talk to the media, in reality nowadays, result in three or four TV trucks, two newspaper reporters, some radio people showing up on their doorstep. In my experience, most victims don't want to go through that. And so all you have is police on the scene. How do we get around this? I'm going to guess we all want to go, but we've been, <laughs> no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm the moderator. Bring it on. I mean, my, my, my big suggestion is if the family doesn't want to talk to you, you have to try to find a relative. You have to try to find somebody in the neighborhood. You've got to be creative. And everyone bombarding on the mom at the same time is usually not the best way to go about it. Like one of the things I used to do, and this was many moons ago, was I would look for the relative or the friend, interview them first, and sometimes that friend would then take me to the mother. So I would try to get the community to trust me, and that way, if it's something really big, I'm not with the mob. I go in a different, a different door. You know, that's, that's how, I, how I think. I think that this sort of like everyone chasing the mother at the same time is, I mean, not everyone's gonna wanna talk. And so when I did the documentary and I hear like what Angie says and Orande say, I know that that's, you, we also can't do every, a story on every single person that has been shot in Philly. Just, this is not gonna happen. So it's, it's a lot of picking and choosing. And these are the things that I find really complicated, and which is why I'm glad we're talking about it, because only by talking about it can we figure out a, a formula that works. And to me, it's the community. It's also bigger picture. You know, why is this happening? If it's the same neighborhood all the time, maybe you don't need the mother that day. Maybe she could be in a follow-up after the family sees that you've done stuff to actually look at the chronic conditions in this community. Um, I guess I would just say, uh, and again, I'm, you know my background, I'm not a journalist, but why is that the news story? Why do you have to go to the crime scene? Would you go to the scene of a sexual assault and report from there? Would you go to a scene of a suicide and report from there? These people who are getting shot are the victims of violence. They are hurt people. Why are we reporting about them like this? Why would we all descend upon a mother to cause a second trauma? Can we think about what we're doing and how we're telling the stories in a different way? Number one. Number two, if we're still at the crime scene and we're interviewing police, there are ways to humanize a victim, right? You know, we have these 7,000 TV news clips. We can see how the dog walker was humanized, the white young man who was shot in Brewerytown, right? He, from the very beginning, was called an innocent victim multiple times in multiple of the news stories. He was described as a, as a boyfriend, a son, a brother, a human. So I think it's also, even if we are going to the scene, using that humanizing language, and that's all in here, you know, I mean, obviously we know it's not gonna necessarily change overnight. 
big picture goal is, is that we are doing thematic reporting. We are talking about the root causes of gun violence. We are, when we're telling stories of survivorship, not doing it right when somebody has been shot, because that's not trauma informed. And, but if we are still at the scene, we're humanizing the person and we're not spreading or reinforcing harmful racist narratives about the people and places that gun violence is impacting. I think oh. if you start doing that though, I think that's when you start noticing that people trust you more, honestly. Because I know when I was reporting, I had a lot of success interviewing family members and it was mostly because I did it so much and people read my stuff and they knew that I cared that they would talk to me and sometimes lock out TV and the Enquirer and only let me in the house. And so when you do the things that Jessica said, that's how you start to build that trust. And right now we're so far behind the eight ball, we need to, to rejigger this and, and take chances because this whole idea of like the only narrative comes from the police or we need them so desperately, you know, I, I kind of call bull on that because I don't, I mean, I, I, think the, I think the stories are with the community, are with the people, and I think it's about humanizing people and recognizing <coughs> that this is happening to black and brown people and that we need to respect them and honor their trauma. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 just, I just say in my opinion, like, yeah, it's, it's all about trust. What if they having a cookout? All you gotta do is pull up and trust the community, just talk to them. It don't have to be a murder or a shooting. Go around the neighborhood and just talk to them. So if something do happen, they will see your truck. They will run to your truck. I know the ice cream man, I only, only go to his truck because he come every day. So that's my opinion. And I promise not to do the last word in every round, but that reminded me of things. <laughs> and um, the, um, but, but, but Jim, to, to your point, you know, I, I work, oh, for everybody's benefit, I work with some very, a very rigorous researcher and very diligent colleagues here. And, the, and we're not all perfectly like-minded ourselves. And Yvonne's been very restless over the last <laughs> yeah, couple of days, amazing. spotting some little contradictions in our messaging and how do we defend that. And if you look at, if you look at the second trauma, Armand saying, you know, we, we, we were overwhelmed by the media and Angela saying nobody came and called me. So the answer is it's complicated. Yeah. And I, I'm not a doctor, but doctors tell me about my care that not every patient reacts the same way to the same treatment. And that's just it. Everybody's individual. You know, every, every, everyone, everybody's unique, and, and everybody's going to respond differently. So it's not a one. We don't have we don't have a magic wand, but we just think there's a lot of room to do better. There was yeah, there was a second one to this table first. Thank you, and I'll come back. So I had two thoughts while watching the documentary. One was kind of just related to what you said about the contradictory. But first, also I recognize that this is coming from a place of defensiveness. I just want to say that I recognize <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. um, but the first thought was. The narrative that you know the media never covers positive stories, that always just frustrates me because I think that those stories do exist. I just don't think that they get as much engagement. And I don't think that's necessarily anybody's fault, but I'm just wondering, like, for example, just by the nature of social media algorithms, the stories that get the most likes and comments and shares are the ones you're gonna see. And oftentimes those are the ones that are about the violent crime, the negative stories. And the ones about the solutions just kind of get buried even if we do them. Do you think there's any role on the consumer's part to seek out those stories, prop up those stories, share those stories? I just, I, I'd like to draw a distinction between a positive story and a solution story. So solutions journalism is not a puff piece, right? Solutions journalism's goal is to actually kind of look at, at, at a problem from a public health lens and ask, who's doing what and what's working and to look for evidence. So um, I know that we're hearing we want positive stories and that is something that we often hear. And I guess I would just say that I think maybe a little bit more nuance on it is, is that we want, we would recommend stories about solutions. Those are the things that seem to be the most helpful to our society and to our public. And when we did research, we looked at the TV news clips, a sample of them, and to see if any of them were following the recommendations from the Solutions Journalism Network and not a single TV news clip that we sampled followed all of the recommendations for solutions journalism. So I think that that's you know, one thing that I think we could see better. In terms of consumers and engagement, it's a little bit not my wheelhouse, so, uh, but when we've been on panels and had other conversations with journalists, I think some of it has to do with education and expectations, right? So you know, 
you have to create the content to see if people will engage with it. If there are no solutions pieces on television news in Philadelphia, we can't necessarily say people are not engaging with it. Um, and I will just also say kind of our emerging research is showing that this graphic content, even at something as simple as police imagery and the shell casings, people, that is harmful, right? I think we have enough evidence to suggest that our panel of experts and our survivors and our co-victims are f feeling harmed by graphic imagery. Journalism research shows that that does not produce empathy, right? It doesn't. It doesn't make people empathetic to the problem. There's a lot of other ways to make people empathetic to pr the problem. So I guess I would say there's no, e even if we are having some positive pieces, your, your public and your survivors are responding that way because the harmful stuff is just so harmful and so overwhelming and so traumatizing. So in addition to offering some alternative narratives that are helpful, minimizing the harmful narratives are important. And we're never gonna kind of get to people recognizing this unless we stop shocking and traumatizing people with the graphic narratives. And then just, just you know, organizationally, yesterday we had a, a similar question about what, what the, I don't know if I'm looking at the right person up, but, but the role of the community and what people in the community could do better around a particular issue. And I'm not here to shut down your question, but that's just outside the scope of our work. I'm sure we, we all have, I'm sure we all have opinions just like everybody out there, but we're not, we're not uniquely informed in that area. Speaking for myself, but that, that's, that's not the, the mission of our organization. So this, this is not my mission as well, but I, this is what I would like to see. Just like suicide, when something is a commercial suicide or is a news on suicide, there's always a hotline number, there's always commercial after. Gun violence, when they tell a story, is never like a resource line or any communities that will, can help a survivor or a co-victim. It just skip to another story. I want to follow up on that because we, we, we can, no, but this is about, about what we've done together. We had we had our first national conference before we launched the center, uh, right before the pandemic in 2019, and. Um, and since since a, a, a mother who lost her son brought it up there that she couldn't she she saw resources for people related to suicide and addiction and other issues but not for survivors of gun violence or co-victims of gun violence. Since then, we have seen a movement in the city where more and more news organizations are including store uh, are including links to resources. Sometimes ours, sometimes their own, sometimes somebody else's. At the end of digital reports on local gun violence, and that's a great first step. It sure would be a lot more impactful, obviously, if, if, if those resources were shared on air as well.